Good evening. Welcome to the dialogue with Werner Herzog. It is our great honor to have well-renowned filmmaker Werner Herzog with us today at the University of Hong Kong. We have here with us a very special crowd, 148 selected audience from documentary and film industries, journalists, teachers, writers, artists, architects, students, historians, NGO administrators, businessmen, lawyers, diplomats, anthropologists, ecologists, and so on. We share the same identity tonight here. We are fans of Werner Herzog's films. Tonight, we are also joined by audience in Taipei through online streaming. They will share a few questions with Mr. Herzog throughout the night. And we would like to thank the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts and Intuitive Media for making this live streaming possible. On behalf of the organizer, Hong Kong Documentary Initiative and Journalism and Media Studies Center of the University of Hong Kong, we would also like to thank the Hong Kong International Film Festival Society, Goethe Institute Hong Kong, and our strategic partner and sponsor, Lee Heisen Foundation, to support this event. <laughs> now, and now please invite Ruby Yang, Oscar winner and project director of Hong Kong Documentary Initiative to say a few words, Ruby. Thank, thank you very much. We, we really fortunate to have Warner Herzog, the renowned filmmaker, to have the dialogue with us. And uh, um, Hong Kong Documentary Initiative was started three years ago with the funding of Lee Heisen Foundation. Uh, there are two, uh, three components to the, uh, the documentary initiative. One is the seek grant, the second is um, master classes, and third one, dialogue with filmmakers. And we have actually, uh, Catherine, project manager, tried for two years to get Mr. Warner Herzog to come. And, um, you know, sh she's very good at uh, writing very good email. And I'm really. <laughs> So um, uh, thank you, and um, actually I'd like to thank uh, Lucky. Um, yeah, he's producer of um, on her. So actually, Catherine wrote to him f for over two years in order to make this happen. Oh, he, you reply right away. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, may I introduce Mr. Warner Herzog to the stage. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I know how much work there was behind it. Uh, and it's in the detail. Uh, mm. Nobody sees how many hours, uh, how many people have worked mm. on putting this together. And it's not only the festival or this mm -hmm. event tonight. We do have a retrospective of 20 or 22 of my films. So there's an enormous workload. Yes. And many of those who have contributed are not visible tonight. Mm. So thank you all for this. Yes. Please have a seat. Yes, uh, filmmaking is always a collaborative effort. And um, actually, I personally, my, my Facebook for the last two days have been plastered with your pictures. <laughs> Fans taking pictures of you and uh, with you and uh, you talking on stage, you visiting various places in Hong Kong. So uh, just uh, some very standard questions. How do you find this city as from a filmmaker's point of view? I, I was here too short time to um, have any real idea, but uh, it is obvious it's a stunning city, mm -hmm. stunningly beautiful and, and extremely vibrant. There's enormous amount of life. And uh, first thing I, I did was I went to the fish market where <laughs> to see the real people. And I would go, for example, in England, I would mm. immediately go to the football stadium. <laughs> the and real would, people. Yes, when yes. you watch, when you watch uh, mm -hmm. 
Liverpool playing mm -hmm. Manchester or so. That's mm. where you really see the people. <laughs> and uh, I, I like to, to mm. have this direct, instant mm -hmm. contact. Yeah, there's, um, even before we start, Mr. Herzog is already giving advice to us as filmmakers. You always look for the real thing, real people. That's what documentaries yeah. are about. Uh, in a way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and uh, we will go on and move to uh, the Q and A sessions. Um, I'd like to ask. You've mentioned Facebook already. Facebook's been in the news a lot the last couple of days. <laughs> Based on your your last documentary, Lo and Behold, would you delete Facebook? And if so, what would you replace it with? And uh, do you think? Um, that's all I'm going to say. That's fine. Okay. I don't. No, it's an easy answer. I don't have to delete Facebook because I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> and I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on whatever. Um, and I do not have a cell phone. Uh, not that I'm, I'm not nostalgic, but I, for cultural reasons, I do not want to have a cell phone. And I want to uh, uh, examine the real world. Uh, not through applications on uh, on a handy. Um, I can give you an example what what I mean to say. When I edited, uh, lo and behold, uh, Reveries of the Connected World, the film on the internet, my editor's girlfriend would visit us almost every day. And after a month of coming by, f coming from nearby by car, a mile away, uh, she frantically made phone calls. She could not find us. What happened? Her GPS was down. And it was only five blocks down and then to the left and then to the right. But she never examined mm -hmm. the, out, the, the layout of the streets or the buildings and how many traffic lights. She would only examine it through her GPS, through the internet. And uh, I found it very significant. And I, I was really mystified that after 30 times visiting us, she could not find us. <laughs> and it was the easiest thing. Um, many of your films feature people who believe in something as if they are in a trance, and sometimes they're in a trance for real, like in Heart of Glass. Um, can you share something personal about why you are interested in these kinds of states of being? Uh, that's a complex question, uh, although it sounds easy, but um, I've always been interested in our uh, human condition. And some of the human condition that I am fascinated in is, for example, fever dreams in the jungle. And that's why I did films like Aguirre, The Wrath of God, or Fitzcarraldo and others. You're mentioning one film, Heart of Glass, where all the actors play under hypnosis, under real hypnosis, and it's not a gimmick. It's not that I, I wanted to show something very special and funny or so. The story is the story of a Bavarian village in the 18th century that lapses into collective sort of almost insanity or trance or somnambulism and they walk into a foreseen and prophesized uh, disaster. That's described to them, and yet they, they move into, uh, into this uh, catastrophe. And I thought for a while, how would I stylize this? And then all of a sudden I thought, why shouldn't they be under real hypnosis? However, I did not know, can you be hypnotized so deeply that you would open your eyes without waking up? Second basic question was, uh, do you... Um, under hypnosis, uh, make contact with somebody else under hypnosis. So we tested it, and since that was okay, uh, all the actors were playing under hypnosis. And I had to learn it myself because we had a hypnotist who was a complete uh, new age, pseudo philosophical <laughs> babble idiot. And, and I couldn't take it any longer after two sessions and I had to take over. <laughs> but it's, there, there is a very deliberate, deliberate idea behind it, and it's a question of stylization. How do I stylize somnambulism? How do I stylize 
human beings who are into fever dreams? How do I stylize um, a, a whole cast that was only midgets, even dwarfs started small, um, a very early of my films. And until today, I'm kind of trying to explore deep, unknown recesses of our soul. I was wondering, do you have an event or something, you know it's out there, you want to film it, but you also know you won't get to do it because maybe you won't live long enough or, or some other thing? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> because of what I did. Uh, you, won't, the you won't live long enough. You, won't. Uh, you know, maybe it's the completion of a building that will happen. You know, John Malkovich made a film that wouldn't be released in a, a hundred years later. I think it was something like that, right? Uh, no, I was asking kind of the I'd, opposite of that question. No, I'd, I'd better uh, make a film and release it right away. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, uh, uh, it, it has become a complex question nowadays because the... Uh, instruments of distribution, uh, like the classical, let's say, movie distribution is, is, is sinking slowly and in, in degeneration, so is television. It's going down and at the same time we are witnessing an explosive evolution of the internet. And that's where we have interesting immediate, uh, immediate sort of uh, possibilities for distribution of films. However, with uh, certain caveats, uh, I don't have to tell you about uh, what the internet uh, can do and the kind of stupidities and, and uh, vile and debased things are explosively uh, created at the internet. And um, so we have to learn how to, how to use this instrument properly. But the great advantage is that you make a film and it can be shown instantly. And it's instantaneously almost worldwide. And um, so that's, that's what I really like to see, however, with certain cautions. Uh, my question is, how do you balance between a subject that you're genuinely interested in and what you think is good to show the audience, or it would sell better, or is there ever a conflict? That's hard to answer because I would do a film only if I'm totally fascinated of the person or of the story. And it would be so, I would do a film only when I know it's so big that what somehow uh, is coming alive in my, in my mind will find its audience. There's a story, let's say, Grizzly Man. I knew it was so big, the story was so big, I had to do this. And I knew it would find audiences. So you, you know that when you are into, into real filmmaking and into, into storytelling. And it was actually a, a film that I, in a way, wrestled away from a production company and wrestled away from somebody who was halfway undecided whether he should do the film or, or not. And I said to him, no, I will direct this movie now. <laughs> and I said it with my worst German accent. <laughs> I, I, I will direct this movie now. And, and so, uh, and, and all of a sudden I was in business. And um, you see, uh, it's, it's coming at me uh, sometimes like uh, without too much uh, thinking. And, and so I, I instantly know that what's coming at me is, is really big and, and, and has its own force. Sometimes like burglars in the middle of the night. You don't know why they come into your home, why, what's, what brings them mm -hmm. in here. But you have to cope with them. Yeah, just um, this part of an interesting thing about filmmaking, yeah. you have to say, I want to take over this thing in a way. I want to do it, be determined. Yes, what's interesting in this case, I asked immediately when, mm -hmm. when I stumbled into it, mm -hmm. or the story stumbled into me, mm -hmm. and I immediately started to ask about the status of the production. It had mm -hmm. to start almost immediately in mm -hmm. 10, 12 days. Mm -hmm. And I asked the producer, who has also made some films, but mostly producer, and I asked him, and you have to listen very carefully, now I ask him who is doing, who is directing the film, mm -hmm. and he said, I'm kind of directing the film. Mm -hmm. Kind of kind. directing the film. <laughs> so 
In other words, I sensed he was not sure whether he should do it and how mm. to do it. And that was when I said, no, I will do this film now. And he was kind of relieved and glad that mm -hmm. I took over. Uh, I realized that there is a strong personality into your films, all the films, I mean. Uh, I, my question is, how do you put your personal, like your personality into your movies, like almost every movies? And how do you build this kind of style? And another thing is that um, some people may super into this kind of style, into your personality, but other audience maybe think it's kind of distracting <laughs> uh, sometimes. So how do you think about this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do not have any ambitions to implant myself into the films, but it has turned out that uh, audiences like to hear my voice and not... <laughs> no, it's, it's not just the voice. You, you have to make you have to make a clear a clear distinction because I wrote the commentaries, um, and um, it has a certain authenticity, and of course uh, it's it's a performative sort of of voice, and it has it has been a, an element in my films that has resonated with audiences. And that's the only reason why I do it. Otherwise, you do not really see me in my own film sometimes as an extra somewhere quickly in the background. And um, you see me in, in films by others, like uh, Jack Reacher, where I play a, a villain uh, <laughs> confronting uh, the, the protagonist. Uh, and... Um, I, I I was pretty good as a villain. <laughs> yeah, I had I had to uh, I had to spread uh, fear and terror on screen. And of course, it's people think, ah, oh, yeah, he must be a terrifying sort of of person. I don't think that is a correct uh, uh, impression. I I think I'm not like that. But uh, I like a performative part of what I'm doing. Um, with regards to Grizzly Man, because um, you brought it up, there is a scene in which you tell Jewel that she must absolutely not listen to the audio tape and that she must never ever see the coroner's photos. Um, with regards to this film, um, I mean, with, regards, with regards to this scene, I felt that there was a deep compassion and kindness that you had towards her at the time. And I was just wanted to ask a general question of how do you retain a certain kindness and compassion whether it's towards your subject or your um, topic at hand, um, as a documentary filmmaker, um, both from a personal perspective and also from a filmmaker's perspective? Well, uh, the answer is simple. I'm not a robot. <laughs> and I'm not speaking to robots. Uh, and of course, when it comes to such uh, horrors uh, of the death of two young people, who were very close to Jewel, to the young lady who has been uh, an associate uh, of uh, Timothy Treadwell, who was attacked and eaten by a bear. So, of course, uh, I have heard what's on the tape, and that's what nobody should ever hear, what I've heard. Secondly, I have seen photos at the coroner's office, some of the remains of... Uh, Timothy Treadwell and his girlfriend, Amy Huguenard. And again, nobody, nobody should ever see what I have seen. And um, it has happened in a similar way with a series on films on, uh, on death row candidates, on, on people who were waiting for the execution, and they made eight films, and there was a particularly horrifying case of a young girl who just had started to walk and to speak, and she was murdered by her father or her stepfather and her mother in a botched exorcist ritual. I mean, unspeakable. And I wanted to have uh, photos from um, the homicide detectives of, of the crime scene, and I said, please leave the photos of the victim out. 
And they showed me, they projected photos, and all of a sudden there's a photo of this girl. And they quickly tried to, to switch over to the next photo, again a photo of the girl, and again, and then I said, no, I, I have to walk out. And uh, uh, the same night, the same night, I woke up because I heard a scream. And I woke up, and it turned out that it was me who screamed. So, in other words, I'm not a robot. And uh, from that moment, it was clear I would not continue the series of films because um, a, <clears throat> the, the, the television network, um, Discovery Channel, actually wanted me to do four more films. Mm. And uh, I called them next day and I said, no, I'm, this is it. And uh, there's a certain a certain uh, economy with your own emotions. So not only with the emotions of uh, human beings who are in front of your camera, there's also somebody behind the camera. Sort of continuing from that, but to a, maybe a, a, a broader level, what is, the, what is the impact of making these films on your view of the human condition. You mentioned before that you, you're very interested in that. And so over the years, making these films, has it given you a more positive or a more negative view of the human condition? I cannot divide the world into whether it's positive or negative in what my world view is. It's, uh, there's always a certain complexity when you are dealing with human beings. And when you try to explore what is going on, so I try to avoid to, to divide the world into good or bad or into positive or negative. And so, um, but of course, uh, doing the films that I have done has given me a lot of insight. Uh, more than, for example, uh, all my time in school has given me. So a single film, a single day of shooting sometimes uh, would outdo five years in school. Um, it's, uh, it's an intense profession and it uh, has to be approached with, um, with an open mind, but at the same time you have to know that there are certain limits and there are certain limits of discovering uh, and, and explaining the world. Uh, although when you look at my films in in their totality, and I mean the feature films and documentaries and all sorts of other things, um, there, is a, there is a world view in it, but not simplistic into the world is good or the world is bad. Do we have uh, contact to Taiwan now? Or? Um, I'm not sure if the connection will be working, so I'm asking on behalf of them because they send me yeah. questions in English. Which one is more important in filming documentaries, the subject or the director? Oh, the director doesn't count. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's always the subject or the substance of things. And uh, many of the films I have made, I'm sure uh, many of the young filmmakers even here present could have made themselves. Um, uh, of course, you have to you have to understand um, you have to understand what the craft is and what the uh, possibilities are, and you have to have a fairly clear vision of what you are doing. Otherwise, you uh, would be you would lose yourself easily. But the the director isn't that important. <laughs> okay, let's take one more from Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah. Please. What gets your attention the most in Taiwan? Have you been to Taiwan? Uh, I've never been in Taiwan, but I, I do have my attention. I've been invited to ta Taiwan, for example, by Edward uh, Yang, a filmmaker who uh, was very, very fond of my films. And I think he started to become a filmmaker because he loved my stuff. And he said, you have to come to Taiwan. And I looked a little bit into what was Taiwan all about. And I decided I would like to come, but I would like to go into the mountains. They're very serious, very, very high mountains. Mm. Nobody talks about it. Ooh. And there's very ancient sort of people there. Hmm. who speak their own language, who are 
very mm. mysterious mountain people up there. <laughs> and and if I go to Taiwan, of course, I would uh, speak to students and show my films, but then I would be straight up in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so our Taiwan friends uh, will remember this. <laughs> and, and they're really big, serious mountains. Anyone from Taiwan here? In the audience? Yes, yeah. there is a few. Maybe we can give a I, question. Am, yeah. Am I completely wrong about Taiwan too? <laughs> no, I, <clears throat> at least Anyone from Taiwan got a question, maybe? <laughs> at least I have some sort of curiosity. Maybe we mm. can yeah. give the microphone to the gentleman here. Um, here in the oh. center of the row. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Oh, for the question or about Taiwan? <laughs> no, no, let's... Uh, I, since I have never been in Taiwan, I, I'm just fantasizing, I'm sorry. No, you're but I'm right. curious. Um, yeah, there are, uh, I think, nine indigenous tribes that live in, in different parts in the mountains and they have their own culture and they have their own yeah. different way of life. You know, so yeah, I would like to see a documentary from you. <laughs> no, no, I'm not speaking about that. I want to do a documentary. I want to be there. Oh yeah, I want, sure. I want to climb and I want to, I want to eat their food and learn how to cook their. I want to have their spices, their recipes, their songs. Yeah. It's not that you always have to make a film. <laughs> I recommend the, um, the, the night markets in Jilong. Very okay, good. yes. Uh, <laughs> right, that, sounds, that sounds like a, like a plan. <laughs> uh, oh, but I recommend you should go with the whole group of people because yeah. you want to try as many things as you can. Yes. So if you by yourself, then you can, you know, you have to finish yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, I wouldn't thing, know you know. what to search for. Okay. Yeah. Is that inflation or yeah. the question? Do you have a question, yeah. really? <laughs> Okay, my question is, uh, I know that you have uh, highly recommended a book called uh, uh, The Peregrine, and yeah. so I would like to know what's your favorite thing about it and what, has, what impact has it made on you as a person, as a filmmaker? Well, <clears throat> I recommended it for various reasons, and I'm speaking now to the filmmakers in particular and, and those who are students of other subjects. People do not read enough anymore. Mm. Uh, normally... Uh, when you look at even at, at university students, they are, they are not reading enough books anymore. They are too much on Twitter and on Facebook and whatever. And, and they take their shallow informations from the internet via Google or whatever. Um, and for, for young filmmakers, I keep saying uh, the craft, the basics of filmmaking, you can learn in a week. You don't have to go four years to film school. It's very depressing to spend four <laughs> years in film school. You can learn a few technical things, but you can learn it while doing uh, things. And um, The Peregrine now in particular uh, by an unknown uh, writer, J.A. Baker. It was published in 1967 and has become some sort of a, um, some sort of a bestseller. Uh, be, and, and many people now are pushing it for several reasons. Number one, um, it is very simple observation of peregrine falcons that were at the brink of extinction in, in the United Kingdom. There were only 14 healthy breeding pairs of them left. Today they have rebounded to some extent. And it was like observing the very last few remaining uh, peregrine falcons. And the observation is with such intensity and such incredible passion. You have never seen anything as passionate. And that's how, as filmmaker, we should view, look at the world. We should look at people with this kind of, of intense uh, compassion and 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 joy and uh, and so. Besides all of that, uh, it has prose of a quality we have not seen since Joseph Conrad. When you read uh, short stories by Joseph Conrad, it's it's about that kind. Not throughout the book, there are moments in it where you read, where you read a paragraph that you have never seen of that quality in English language. It's phenomenal. 
And I think um, it's very much worthwhile for young filmmakers. Read this book. It's more worth than a whole year in film school. And do we try to start to communicate with Taiwan again? I want to ask, uh, ah. what's the attitude for world faith? When I moved a ship over a mountain in Fitzcarraldo, mm -hmm. <laughs> I kept saying, uh, you cannot solve it with cash money. Mm. It's only faith that moves mountains. <laughs> it's never been the money. Mm. And uh, it has carried the film along in a way. And uh, otherwise, religious faith, uh, I had a dramatic religious phase when I was an adolescent. It disappeared fairly quickly, but I do understand uh, uh, the, the religious sentiment in the, the soul of people that gets engaged with uh, religion and the kind of consolation that people find in religion, uh, consolation in a world that uh, cannot be deciphered completely and that can be very scary. And of course, the question of our own mortality scares many, many people. And the only consolation in this case uh, that we have is religion. So, um, and, and they are those who, who really solidly rely uh, in religious faith uh, systems uh, are, are fairly lucky. And I know that you don't go to a film school. Actually, you stole a film camera from a school and you start filming. <laughs> and I think you don't like film school and you don't really advocate people going there. But then I know like these years you started teaching film courses like in master class or some short courses in the States. What do you think what makes you change your mind and what do you think is the most important thing you actually teach these yeah. young filmmakers? Thank you. I never had <clears throat> I never had the plan to to do a master class, for example, or to actually start it as a as a counter position against all the film schools that as we know them by founding my own rogue film school, which is uh, guerrilla style and you learn, the only things that you really learn is lock picking or foraging documents, <laughs> like foraging a shooting permit uh, and things like that. So, so it's, it's fairly wild, it's wild stuff, but it points to a, a certain approach, to a certain way of life, to a certain self-reliance and that's what I try to tell young filmmakers do not wait for Hollywood to invite you to do a big film. They do not come. They will not invite you. Uh, you have to take initiative. And today you can make a feature film, even for theaters, with a cell phone. And we have seen that. So I don't like this culture of complaint, oh, money uh, is not interested in me. Just do your film for literally no money. And the reason why I am uh, starting to pass on what I, uh, what I have learned in, in many films is that a huge, huge amount of young filmmakers are approaching me. They want to either learn from me or be my assistant in one of the films. But there are so many. It's a, it's a gigantic avalanche that has... <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. It's, it's really big. Uh, and I try to give a systematic answer, an organized answer, uh, because uh, I, I have the feeling with all the privilege that I have had to make these films, I have to share some of my experiences. And Masterclass, which is a company in the United States called Masterclass, you can learn playing tennis, for example, with uh, Serena Williams. Or you can learn acting with uh, Dustin Hoffman and you can learn about architecture and all sorts of things. So, uh, and they invited me to do a master class, which is online. And it's very, very intense. It's no nonsense. You see, I, I saw, for example, uh, some actors uh, doing a master class and they make little jokes and this and that. Uh, you don't waste your time. It's six hours, really intense. 
and on all and, and systematic. It's on various aspects like uh, uh, film and music or editing or how do you survive in the business uh, long term. Uh, all sorts, how do you deal with actors, how do you uh, make conversations on camera in a documentary. Mm. So there's a lot, a lot of things that uh, I try to pass on and I do it seriously. It's, it's not a joke. And uh, nobody can watch it six hours like this because you, you, you would... Uh, uh, you would probably lose your mind over it after. It's enough to see it in 15, 20 minutes in increments. My question was about creativity and if you've ever felt uh, blocked uh, creatively and uh, what did you do to unblock or, or find the, the path of the inspiration? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I've never been blocked. <laughs> so it's an, an unknown sort of thing for me and uh, my problem is that I can never keep up with the amount of things that are coming at me. While I'm sitting here and I just showed my last film Into the Inferno, there are three, four, five other projects. While I'm sitting here, I'm already working on a film on Mikhail Gorbachev and some other projects. So. Um, I, I have not been blocked, and I wish uh, the burglars would not come at me all the time. I did spend four years in film school, and I can confirm it's quite depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my question is that many people associate your films with some certain extreme natures, either with environment or with the humanities in general. And what does the concept of extremeness mean to you? Do you think it's a... Exposi exposition of our origin or some new possibilities or something else? <laughs> well, it's, cinema has, uh, has some very basic uh, focus and uh, of course uh, we are not really that much fascinated uh, watching somebody uh, doing their laundry. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a, a cinema, we are much more fascinated by stories that take us into wild adventures or wild fever dreams or into uh, human beings that are um, tested to their limits because only then we, we learn much more about ourselves. It's like when you're a scientist and you are testing, a, let's say, a metal alloy. You put it under extreme radiation, and under extreme heat, under extreme pressure and all of a sudden you would understand the inner nature of this metal, of this piece of metal. And cinema works in a, in a similar way. But of course there are simpler forms of cinema, basic forms like that I call movie movies, kung fu films, movie movies, or um, I would say Fred Astaire whom I like a lot. Uh, and it's basically a man who is dancing. Or uh, films like um, Mad Max, kinetic uh, energy, two cars uh, crashing into each other at very high velocity. So this kinetic event, this uh, in enormous force of movement, that's also a very fertile uh, area of filmmaking. I've actually never been into car crashes. I've never made a film with um, Fred Astaire. I, I wish I had, I had lived a generation earlier. I would have liked to make a film with him. I always wanted to make a film with um, Michael Jackson, for example. <laughs> he he is such such a great such a great mover, and um, so they 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 do not. They are not born very often. But I don't know whether I really answered your questions. <laughs> but, yeah. Do you feel like you've ever been manipulated by the subject of one of your films? Or is that all a part of the process? Was it manipulated. Do you ever felt manipulated by the subject that you filmed? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't think so. Uh, 
is maybe secretly somebody ever tried, but not to my knowledge. Uh, and cinema has something very revealing. You can tell right away, for yeah. example, that somebody is lying to you. You, you. you know it instantly because cinema has a, a quality that, that starts to reveal layers of, uh, of, of truthfulness or layers of lies. I don't think so, and uh, sometimes, yes, I would allow people to lie to me, for example, into the uh, abyss, a young man who was executed eight days later, and he tells me he spent 10 years in prison because uh, when he committed his crimes, a triple homicide, he was 18, spent 10 years in uh, on death row and then was executed. And he, some so kind of uh, saving his sanity in, in this crazy situation of being on death row, talked himself of, to, uh, in, into a position being innocent. But of course, I had looked into the case files and the film doesn't mention many, many details. For example, that there was a young woman who was at the crime scene when the murders happened, because I did not want to, to make him look too bad. He still had a last uh, appeal for clemency going on. And he completely convinced himself, believing in his own narrative, that he never had anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I allowed him to tell me that on camera. And, and you do that sometimes. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, there's a human being who will be dead within eight days. And you are sitting in safety on the other side of the bulletproof glass. And you are sitting next to a camera. So th there are situations where you do allow somebody to lie to you. And, and I can accept it easily. Going with this theme of lying, you expounded this concept of the ecstatic truth. And I wonder, now that you're living in the US, I think, um, with Trump and with all of the sort of bombast and just the falsity and all of these things, is there something of this ecstatic truth in the world today that's out there in the sort of zeitgeist? I don't know. No, it, ecstatic truth does, does not uh, correspond, for example, to fake news. Okay. And fake news is nothing new. <laughs> it is absolutely nothing new and we know from the earliest uh, documentation of, uh, of political life. We know it from uh, Egyptian pyramids. I think, uh, I believe it was one of the Ramses uh, pharaohs who depicts himself uh, in, um, uh, in uh, paintings and in mosaics as a great victorious sort of slayer of nations and, uh, and conqueror of the Hittites. That's how the facade was. But we know there's a surviving text of a peace treaty which points at a battle that was inconclusive, that which neither side won. So he made it up. So from the earliest evidence we have, there were fake news. And, and we had them... Um, all the time in, in Roman antiquity, near the Emperor Nero, or uh, in Russia, the, for example, the Potemkin's villages, somebody building up facades of villages to make his area looking very prosperous and very neat and impressing Katerina, the great, who was traveling through in her, in her coach. So Trump is nothing new. And we have to understand that uh, with the internet, uh, of course, fake news spread with much higher velocity than we have ever seen it before. And I have to point out, uh, just uh, a few days ago, I came across a story which was during the elections. And we have the name who spread the fake news, a retired engineer who was grumpy over 70 years old, a grumpy old man, puts on the internet that the two Clintons, Hillary and the Bill, uh, were together into um, child molestation, 
They were together into cannibalism and were together in child sacrifice, human sacrifice. Within, within less than a day, two million people clicked on it. So it's a sensationalistic aspect of the internet in the highly controversial nature. And of course, the internet has one quality that's easy to, to understand. And excuse my French, the shit always floats to the, to the top. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, so you have to learn how to deal with fake news. Uh, and, and we have to, to learn how, how to sniff it out. And, and in most cases, it is very, very easy. There was no child sacrifice. Uh, uh, committed by, by the two Clintons, <laughs> period. We don't need to, to hear their voices. But may I, may I add something about uh, ecstatic truth? Truth normally is not just with the facts. It's way beyond that. And what truth is, nobody of us can really describe. Neither mathematicians or philosoph philosophers can tell us what, what it really is. But we have, an, we have a, a sense for it, uh, how by stylizations and inventions and by poetic fantasy, we can point at a deeper truth. And my simple example is Michelangelo, uh, who did the, sta the sculpture of the Pieta, uh, arguably the most beautiful uh, sculpture that was ever created in the history of art. <clears throat> Jesus in the arms, taken from the cross in the arms of his mother. And when you look at the face of Jesus, he is a 33-year-old man. His mother is 17. His mother is 17. So my question is, did Michelangelo try to give us fake news? Did he try to cheat us? Did he try to, to lie to us? No, he tried to find a deeper truth about the very nature of Christ and the very nature of his mother, the Virgin. So that's, that's a very simple example. And uh, what is going on in political life, and it's not only Trump, we should not go into the business of Trump bashing, that's an easy, an easy thing. It happens on every single side, and it happened since the pharaohs, and probably much earlier before we had written evidence. Uh, in your documentary films, which has uh, nature as one of its themes, uh, you often explore the sublime of the nature as well as nature's absolute indifference towards humans. And what I want to ask is that as a filmmaker, uh, what is your attitude towards climate change? And do you think that the general public has a wrong attitude towards climate change? Thank you. Climate change, I think, uh Everybody who walks uh, on this planet with open eyes sees uh, that we are not treating the planet appropriately. Uh, and I think uh, China has massively understood and is taking measures. And uh, for example, the um, directives of creating electric cars uh, is, is on a scale that we have not seen before. But of course, all this is, is not really enough. And ultimately, um, nature itself, which is indifferent to us, it's, it doesn't love us. It's indifferent to, to all human endeavors and to all species and creatures. But um, when you violate nature, it will hit back. And there's a time that can be foreseen where there might be a world in not too far future where we have no human beings left. And we, we have not a good survival chance. Uh, it's uh, what survives much better is a lizard or a cockroach or, or microbes. They, they have the better chance and we better look carefully what we are doing. And uh, you probably know about a film I made on the internet, Lo and Behold. Um, reveries of the connected world. Among others in the film is Elon Musk, who has a dream of colonizing Mars. 
with uh, human population to save us if this planet here collapses. And I think it's a wrong idea. It's not only a stupid idea, it is utterly wrong because we should, we should focus our attention in making our planet uh, as habitable as possible and not try to improve the habitability or inhospitability of a planet like Mars. We do not belong there. We do not deserve to be there. We, we deserve to be here. So that's what I have to say about ecology. Question from, from Taiwan. Taiwan, because yes. it's related to what you said. Do you think Elon Musk is a good person? <laughs> no, good, good or bad is, is uh, I do not know him enough and, and we should not argue is he good or is he bad. He's an he's a absolutely fascinating personality which comes at the time of gigantic uh, 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 revolutions in manufacturing, for example. And I like him for that. I like him for, for creating the Tesla cars and I like him for creating now uh, batteries, we, I think he's not, it's not finished yet, or reusable rockets. Um, not easy to deal with him because he's a very shy man. He's totally shy and you, and, and journalists have never managed to really deal with him because uh, you would ask him, a, a journalist would ask him a question on live television and he would think about it for two f full minutes. But two full minutes is an eternity. You have to measure how much two minutes actually is. And he sits there and thinks for two minutes and everybody thinks, uh, is he catatonic now? Or what happened to him? <laughs> and then he will give you an answer. So you have, to, you have to tickle him. You have to evoke things from him. And, and I even made him laugh. I, uh, I wanted to know what he's streaming, and he said no. It's, and and then lowered his head, and and then he said, "Do you dream?" I said, "No, I do not dream. Sometimes, maybe once a year." And the last time I dreamt was that, and it's boring. Last time I dreamt was that I had a sandwich for lunch, <laughs> and all of a sudden he laughs, and he was completely on my side, and, and then he says, uh, I do not, after long, long, long brooding, and I filmed him, filmed him, and he's thinking, and he says, well, I don't remember my dreams, I only remember the nightmares. <laughs> and he has never said anything like this in public. So that's, uh, for, for the filmmakers, you have to, you have to, to tickle them sometimes and get something out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, last night, uh, in the post-screening talk, you talk about uh, all good directors read a lot, and I'm very envious of you that you could read um, Latin and also Greek, and you're so versatile in your reading. And could you elaborate a little bit on your world of book reading? Uh, it's unsystematic. That's number one, and uh, and by the way, I hated Latin in school. I hated ancient Greek, so but I, I became more curious uh, in much many many years later. But um, I read out of curiosity, and very often I follow um, leads of very trusted friends who really know about literature and about books, or even things that are not literature, high literature, for example, Errol Morris, who reads voraciously, one of the finest filmmakers that we had. He reads, 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 and he said to me, you have to read, there's a book about, written by a failed lion tamer in a failed circus. And it's heartbreaking. It's, it's very badly written, but it's heartbreaking in a way. So I follow leads and, and I would read what, uh, what I must read according to my friends. Same thing with me, I, I pass on to uh, young people, read The Peregrine, read Virgil, Roman Antiquity and, and other things. 
and when I have a real good book that I read, I, I do not keep them. I, I pass them on to some friends and they pa probably pass them on as well. So um, there's no real system in it. But uh, there's a great joy in reading and uh, uh, I, I do believe that uh, without intense reading, yes, you will be a filmmaker, but a mediocre at best. The real, real good ones are all people who read. And I give you a few names, Terence Malick, for example, Errol Morris, Francis Ford Coppola. He even has his own library, and, and when he was uh, big into uh, uh, the, his big films, he even had his private librarian. Just think about that. It's, it sounds crazy. But uh, many, many of the real good ones are, are people who read. I'm going to ask two questions from Taiwan. Can you share a memory which you treasure a lot? A memory that I treasure a lot, yes, uh, has nothing to do with the film. It has to do with my younger son when he was five years old and I had a telescope and there was full moon and I trained it, I uh, aimed at the full moon and the first time he saw the moon and the mountains and the craters and this kind of, of complete amazement and awe in inner child, that's something which is, uh, uh, which is completely priceless. Mm. Um, and I think when, when you are a parent of, of children, you, once in a while you have to do things like showing them the moon through a telescope. Uh, it's just something that comes to mind. I'm sorry if it's too personal. Yes. How do you decide whether a project goes to documentary or movie? I think all I do is movies. They're just movies. And, and when uh, people ask me uh, about my documentaries, my first instincts, my first instinctive answer would be, I do not make documentaries. They are partially invented, they are stylized, they are um, cast, there's casting like for, um, in a feature film, actors. My documentaries are always very, very well cast. And you see it in Into the Inferno, the leading character in the film, vol the volcanologist Clive Oppenheimer, he's extremely well cast a very likable, a very vivacious uh, man who is a real great scientist at the same time. The people with whom I'm uh, dealing in the film, villagers, tribal villagers in the Vanuatu archipelago, or uh, scientists who are excavating human remains in um, Ethiopia. So it's, mm -hmm. it's casting, and that's something that you normally do not do in feature film, uh, in, in documentaries, uh, or stylizations, even inventions. And it goes so far that at the beginning of one film, uh, which is called Lessons of Darkness, mm -hmm. before you, and it was on the fires in Kuwait, where the entire country was set aflame, every single oil well was burning. When the Iraqis uh, retreated as, as a sign of revenge and hatred, they put all the oil wells on flame. And, and it was not just an ecological crime, it was a crime against creation in a way. And it was an event that uh, gave me the feeling there's something bigger than a political event, there's something cosmic about it. And the film starts with a written caption on, on screen, and it quotes the French philosopher Blaise Pascal. And it says, the collapse of the stellar universe will occur like creation in grandiose splendor. And it says Blaise Pascal under it. However, it was not Blaise Pascal who wrote it, I wrote it. <laughs> it was my invention. Uh, and by the way, Blaise Pascal couldn't have said it better. So. <laughs> 
And uh, why do I do that? I, I want to, in this case, I wanted to uh, elevate the audience to a very, very high level before they see the first image. And I never let them down from, from this very elevated level that this is, uh, this is almost science fiction. It's, it's a planet, I'm showing a planet that we cannot recognize anymore as our planet. So it, it's an it's a extremely high stylization and it's purely invented. And the invention is like the mother of Jesus who is 17 when he is 33. So, and I, I allow myself uh, this, doing this kind of thing, but uh, because of that, I have difficulties to accept that I'm a documentarian. You see, we, we immediately think about the wildlife films from uh, East Africa or about some political films uh, here and there. Uh, I, I have never done that kind of films. I wanted to know about uh, the act of killing and how uh, sort of Joshua Oppenheimer's process in making that film was extremely uh, well thought out and there's a lot of effort put into it. And it's hard to imagine that he could have predicted such a transformative result that, that occurred with the characters in the film. I wanted to know what your opinion was of that transformation and, and particularly how candid they were about the, the, the crimes they committed. Um, well, uh, in, in a way, uh, Joshua Oppenheimer was seeking me out. He wanted to have my advice, and uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Andre Singer in London, with whom I'm doing the Gorbachev film now, his co-director with me, he said to me, I'm executive producer on a film, The Act of Killing, made by a young filmmaker, Joshua Oppenheimer, and he desperately wants to meet you, and I said, well, I'm here only for the next uh, uh, 40 minutes. If he's nearby, let him come. I was at breakfast, the taxi was already waiting. Okay. And he, Joshua came and barely said hello, opened his laptop and showed me eight minutes a comp compilation of footage. And, and my heart stopped for a moment because I had never seen footage like this. I've never, ever seen anything like this. So we stayed in touch and he wanted me to uh, um, give him advice. Basically, my role was to encourage him to do, uh, to do the most extraordinary foot footage and leave it in it. So, some of the most controversial as well. So I had some, some sort of uh, a role in it, mostly encouraging him. And result is one of the films that you see every 20 years maybe of that caliber and of that impact and uh, I'm very proud that I uh, became friends with uh, Joshua and uh, that I could give a tiny little bit of input. But not, not precisely, not, not in, in terms of how to edit the film or how to do this or that. It was basically creating a climate of courage. Just in case um, you don't recall the film, The Act of Killing is a documentary about the um, uh, mass massacre by the Indonesian military yeah. in the 60s. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. the uh, mass uh, murder of, uh, I don't know, almost a million or so yeah. people who were considered communists or foreigners. Mm -hmm. Ethnic Chinese yes. were among those who were uh, who were also murdered, and uh, it's something that we had not uh, had not known publicly mm. very much. Yeah. So my question is, uh, what are your observations on how storytelling has changed and or stay constant over time from since when you first started filmmaking to now? Thank you. I think uh, storytelling fundamentally has never changed. We probably had this gift of storytelling for tens of thousands of years, as long as there's uh, human communication in, around a campfire in, uh, in Paleolithic times, I, I do believe we evolved, we developed uh, uh, the art of storytelling. And um, you see it, it's almost like a, like a deep human memory 
And you see it when, when mothers start to tell stories to their little children. Um, it's something we have in common as, as the human species that we are. And um, it has not changed much uh, when you look, even when you look at Hollywood films, uh, yes, there was more emphasis on storytelling at the time of, let's say, Casablanca. Um, and today, much of it has been replaced by special effects, uh, by merchandising, <laughs> and by star power or star quality. And um, storytelling has, in a way, been partially neglected. And this is why part of Hollywood is looking at my films, because I'm good at storytelling. So uh, they, they keep uh, circling around it. They are curious what I'm doing. <laughs> so and what I'm doing is, uh, is something very innate in human nature, storytelling. And it's not never going to really change. I think not, not in the next 10,000 years. Question from Taiwan. If Timothy and Amy in Grizzly Men are not both dead, but one alive, one dead, how do you approach the topic, or will you shoot it anyway? If, if, if uh, in the Grizzly Men, the couple, yeah. one of them one still of them survives. Had right? survived. What, what will you do? What will, you still, will you still do the film? Or? I, I believe so. It's, you see, you, you can only speculate. Uh, <laughs> Probably, yes, if the survivor had been Timothy Treadwell, I probably would have uh, asked him, give me your footage because I know better what to do with it than you would. <laughs> because he was confused. He was confused about his mm. attitude and his romanticized mm. attitude of wild nature. And I, I would probably have him, had him convinced, let me do this. If Amy Huguenard uh, had survived, that would have been harder. I probably would have asked her to be a contributor to the film on camera mm. because we have very little of her. Mm. And we have li very little of her because, number one, Treadwell never filmed her, with uh, very small exceptions where for seconds you see her. Mm. He tried to stylize himself as the, the lone ranger out there who is separate, who doesn't have a girlfriend. He always had women around. Um, and uh, Amy Huguenard's parents would not allow me to quote from her diary, for example. There's a diary and letters from her. And I accepted it. Uh, it has to be off limits. For me, uh, what is off limits? And uh, had I seen Amy Huguenard as a survivor, I would have tried to persuade her to be part of the film and finally show up in, in front of the camera. Okay, one more question from Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, yes. yes. Do you feel any cultural or linguistic effects on your filmmaking since moving from Germany to other countries, such as the US? And do you ever consider moving back? I cannot foresee the future, but uh, I'm happily married, uh, and that's why I live in, in Los Angeles. Um, moving back to Germany, well, I, um, I'm, I'm moving where the stories are. Hmm. And that was an interesting thing I, I experienced. I did a, a workshop for um, young filmmakers and I made, I chose 10. Um, and it happened to be that seven of them were young women filmmakers. I couldn't care less if it were women or not. And uh, it turned out they had the better proposals and they were more intelligent and had <laughs> the more exciting things. And one of them was Brazilian and she said, I'm finishing all this now in Germany and what should I do? Should I try to enter a career in Germany or should I go to Barcelona because there's some good or interesting scene? Or should I go back to Brazil to where I was born in the south of Brazil? I said, my instincts tell me you should go back to Brazil, but not 
necessarily where you into your hometown, go where the stories are, where life is wild, where things are happening, um, go there. Mm. And I think she's doing it now, and, mm. and the same happens to me. I, I like to be in, in an area or in parts of the world where the stories are. That's why I'm in Vanuatu archipelago, because the tribal people there believe in a new god, an obscure uh, American airman, John Frum, who uh, pos possibly was never there on this island, but they think he's a new god and lives in the volcano. So those are real big stories and you see the origin of a religion right in front of you. And I would go to North Korea because it's the most fascinating uh, country to go and and try to, to make a film, although, of course, you have your limitations. Uh, or I would go to the Amazon jungle because it's full of, of fever dreams. And that's where, where I belong as a filmmaker, not so much to attach to a country. Mm. I was curious about the Julian Donkey Boy film, uh, whether any of the dialogue was scripted beforehand, and could you... Tell a little bit about the process of acting in the Julian yeah. Donkey Boy film. It's a film you're referring to, a film by a young filmmaker, Harmony Corinne, a very, very talented young man. And he uh, wanted me, he sees me as his, as his father figure as a filmmaker. And he wanted me to play the father of a crazed boy, a young man, and he wanted to play my son. <laughs> when I arrived on the set, there was an actor there, and I said, Harmony, why are you not uh, sitting in front of the camera with me? He had, he had bailed out. So, huh. and secondly, there was, there was no Harmony Corinne as an actor to talk to, hmm. and secondly, there was no screenplay. There were some basic situations, for example, I had to uh, have dinner with my family, Two sons, one a complete failure, the other one insane. Uh, the, the sister impregnated by her brother and the, and the grandmother who was completely gaga. And I'm there at dinner and I, they had several cameras and I see the camera lights are turned on and they were still fiddling around and I asked uh, Harmony, he was standing nearby, are we rolling? And he nodded, yes, we are rolling. And I said, what's the dialogue? <laughs> I had no clue. <laughs> I only knew I had to put down my, I had to be hostile with my, with my children and hostile with a grandmother. And I said, what's the dialogue? And he just said, speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> and I really put my son down. I really, I'm really nasty and, and mm. awful with him <laughs> and... Uh, and then I didn't know what else should I tell, and instead of reading me a silly poem, he should do something as great as the end of uh, Dirty Harry, where he blasts the bad guy and asks him, do you feel lucky? <laughs> so, uh, and it, uh, it was just invented because of the pressure on me that I had to say something. There was no written dialogue. Now but remember it. I must say I enjoyed it, and uh, I'm good when I have to play a hostile person, <laughs> or like in Jack Reacher. <laughs> yeah, so um, this room was shown in Hong Kong Festival 20 years ago, was it? Yeah, yeah. It's that long ago. The casting aspect of your movie documentaries, like, what is it you look for? Um, how does it? How do you go about? And uh, could you give us some insights into that? Yeah. Casting, uh, you, you have to, when you make films, you have to understand who is, uh, who is creating intensity and depth and a presence on a screen. And sometimes it's very unobtrusive, unobtrusive persons. Uh, I do remember in the late 60s, I, I met Brigitte Bardot, a tiny mouse. You had, you had no idea that she was a sex symbol. Or I met uh, 
Isabella Rossellini, hmm. and she looks completely like nobody would pay attention to her when you met her in, in private during a dinner. And, and I thought, what, what is it that makes her so intense and so, so wonderful on screen? What is it that makes Brigitte Bardot a, a complete symbol of, of an, an entire epoch? Um, and you have to have the eye for it. I cannot describe exactly what it is. If you do not have that instinct and if you do not have the experience in the real world to understand this person is the right one, if you don't have that, you should not make films. And you cannot teach it and you cannot, cannot really learn it. Uh, I want to ask something about the visual dimension of your work, uh, like when does the visual come come into it, uh, into the process of uh, f forming the thing, or, or maybe something more specific about the Hercules Seegers and what was so interesting about him, where that seemed to be some project you did that it didn't turn out as a, a movie, it turned out as an installation, it needed a different mm -hmm. format or... or yeah. 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 I have to explain, uh, you are speaking of Hercules Segers, a, a Dutch artist of the early Rembrandt time, uh, almost completely unknown. Even uh, people who run museums, like the Whitney Museum that invited me to do an installation, had no clue who Hercules Segers was. I found it very alarming. And uh, I have to explain, he was considered a madman and an alcoholic and had what is left are some very small prints that he did very experimental sort of work, very stylized and some art, early Rembrandt time, some art, some imagery that we have seen only hundreds of years later, only from the 20th century on, we have seen uh, imagery that he has created hundreds of years before the time of this kind of paintings or prints. And um, I always felt very close to him. There, there was somebody who saw uh, certain patterns, certain structures in landscapes or in rocks that uh, always uh, inspired me. And I had seen similar things. So he has become a, a kind of a, a person who was close to my soul. And um, sometimes over long periods of time and you, you all of a sudden recognize as if he were my brother. And the same thing happens in literature that uh, all of a sudden somebody talks to you who has died 200 years ago and still the voice is completely alive and it's completely like somebody who had who had been your brother unbeknownst to you until the moment. So um, imagery, of course, uh, is something which comes fairly early into films. Of course, not into the films where I, had, I have no prior knowledge of what will come at me. I had no prior knowledge about uh, the jungle, for example. And I described the jungle in a way that I said, uh, I do not leave the jungle any choice to be different than my fantasies. And uh, of course you have, to, you have to bring the jungle, the landscape into an, an imaginative form that corresponds with your own dreams. But of course a very deep question, we could sit here the next 48 hours and have a conversation and uh, quote specific, let's say, painters, films, images, photos, you just name it. I can only give you a very, very limited answer. Uh, do you ever have a sense of failure uh, in the whole career? And uh, if, if not, uh, how do you manage to do so? And uh, if yes, how do you overcome such sense? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting question because of course I have had quite a few failures and I have gone through defeats. Uh, but the question is when, when you fail at doing something as, as you had imagined and it doesn't have 
the standard of your uh, of you had what you had anticipated uh, it's always a question how do you learn from your failures and when when you are thrown to the ground how do you get up on your feet again that's a more important thing than the failures how do you survive a failure how do you learn from it how do you improve and uh, it has been throughout my life uh, that I have made uh, mistakes, uh, not all the time, but they have happened, and most of the time they were painful. And you have, as a filmmaker, you have to learn how to cope with it. How do you deal with it? So we touched earlier on the complexity of the human condition, and I wanted to continue with that theme by bringing up a recurring actor in a couple of your films, uh, Bruno S. His performances display a type of emotional depth that's really rare to see in any other type of film. And I was wondering what impact working with him had on you and anything that you could learn from someone you described as having an incredible, incredible amount of humanity and depth within him. Uh, I find it extraordinary and very kind of you that you are speaking about Bruno S. Because people normally focus on Klaus Kinski or Christian Bale or uh, um, whoever, Nicole Kidman, I've worked with some of the best of the best in the world. Uh, Michael Shannon recently. But the, the one who is exceptional in the deepest, the, the deepest, the most tragic I've ever had in front of my camera was Bruno S. And I made two films. One is The Enigma of Kaspar Hauser and the other one is Stroschek, and uh, I owe him a lot. Unfortunately, he passed away two or three years ago, so um, he's not around anymore, and uh, I, I miss him. I never had any other film project where he re really would have fit into, but um, he had a presence and, a, and an aura of uh, tragedy that is unprecedented. There's no one like him anywhere in any cinema in any country. Um, so it's worthwhile to see, for example, Stroschek or the Enigma of Kaspar Hauser. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one question Taiwan, from, the, yeah. from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered to shoot another Signs of Life after 50 years? No. <laughs> you, you do these films once, and, and I, I do not want to do Rambo 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <laughs> or, or, or uh, whatever. No, you, you leave it behind you, and it's, it's a film that's very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. It was my first long feature film mm -hmm. in much of my adolescence and of my uh, early and young years as a filmmaker, all in, in this film, but I've... I'm not the one who would return and uh, and ruminate on a on a film. It's okay. please, yeah. One more. Uh, what's your opinion on the influences of new digital technology and internet on the production or distribution of documentaries? Um, I think uh, since the the normal forms of distribution are all in decline the theatrical releases and television is in decline and we have uh, uh, extraordinary uh, development in the in the internet and and we have to take it seriously and i've been curious about it and uh, i have explored certain aspects of it for example a few of my films are on netflix uh, some of, uh, almost all my films you can find on the internet and you can buy the films as a Blu-ray or as a DVD and it goes through the portal of the internet. Uh, and arguably my biggest uh, success I had on YouTube about texting and driving, <laughs> which was a film uh, sponsored by uh, AT&T and then some other providers like T-Mobile and Sprint and Verizon jumped on board. And um, it has had an, an extraordinary impact. And it was YouTube. And uh, I, I must say, I, I take YouTube and some 
possibilities uh, in this area seriously because sometimes you see the most unexpected coming at you that's completely out of the blue and extraordinary. You sometimes see these things, but you have to be very selective. Uh, you don't need to be selective when it comes to the crazy cat videos. They're always <laughs> funny. They're always, they're always uh, a joy to watch. But, um, but of course, uh, YouTube has sometimes uh, extraordinary, extraordinary gems in it. And you have to sharpen your, uh, your feelers and how you spot those. <laughs> those things. So as a daredevil, you've pushed boundaries and you've explored world for decades. Um, has there some, has there like a um, moment in life where you just had, you just got held back? Like what has been your biggest fear so far <laughs> in your experience? Apart from Michael Shannon. My biggest fear, I, I'm not afraid. It's not in my <laughs> dictionary. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but you didn't mention that you were afraid of Michael Shannon, right? Of Michael, Michael Shannon. Shannon. Why should I be afraid? I'm, <laughs> a, I'm the one who gave him uh, the leading part, uh, the central character in the film, the first one. He, before that, he had only done some small roles in My Son, My Son, What Have You Done? Mm -hmm. uh, he's the first time in his career mm -hmm. the leading central character of a, of a feature film. And, and it was me who gave him this part. <laughs> and I, I tell you why I gave it to him, because he's the most, the most talented of his generation. Mm. Uh, would you please describe um, how is your young life, uh, especially in the field of uh, creating artworks or, or filmmaking? Thanks. It, I think uh, filmmaking itself has, has kept me running and moving and... Uh, uh, somehow I, I do not really feel, feel my age. I'm, uh, I could be your father or your grandfather even, and uh, it doesn't feel like it. Uh, and I think the, the profession itself uh, uh, keeps, you, keeps you agitated and keeps you curious and keeps you uh, in contact with very young people, very young audiences. So I think it's... In, in this respect, filmmaking is a very fine profession. Um, I've admired your films. I was 18 years old, and I want to thank you for always inspiring me to be a good soldier of cinema. Um, <laughs> throughout your films, there's always these kind of astonishing images that kind of tell a truth that you can't really describe with words. I'm like, my mind goes to the scene in Strasak, where you visited the hospital. Um, with the with the babies, uh, with the premature babies, and you see you see the grip that they had, or just the idea of you once said that filming animals there wasn't there, w there was a sense of them not trying to cover themselves up. There was a truth to them, um, and I I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about the idea of collecting these kinds of ideas of images, or the way that you might find these these kinds of images that say something more than what we can actually say with words. Yeah. Uh, that's what I cannot really describe, but I, I try to look behind the surface and I try to uh, find something that is transcending the surface of an image and that's transcending uh, uh, us as, as human beings and I try to, to look somehow into, into the soul of human beings. And of course you... Um, come across with his curiosity, you come across uh, certain images, certain events, certain uh, situations like, for example, a prematurely born baby that like a, like a little monkey, premature babies have this very strong grip. You can even lift them up into the air. You can even uh, put them on a clothesline and they would hang on to it desperately. Uh, <laughs> And uh, when they are born nine months after conception, they, they still have this uh, grip. You, you hold a finger to a little baby and they will hold on immediately, but you could not lift them up in the air anymore. So it's only with premature 
uh, babies, very, very mysterious and very touching how they hang on to life. And um, so when, when you are fascinated in these questions that I am, uh, you would inevitably come across such, uh, such human beings or situations. It's, it's quite natural. Um, you mentioned that you read, but you also write. And you often say that you're certain that your writing is going to outlive your films. I wonder why you say that. Thank you. Um, I may be wrong. <laughs> I'm, uh, sometimes I'm not the best judge of my own stuff. But uh, I, I have the feeling what the prose texts that I have written um, have a more direct intensity uh, than movies because when you make a movie you have actors in between and you have cameras and you have uh, editing and you have finances and you have psychology with a crazy actor and you just name it. You have a torrential uh, downpour of rain when you, are, when you need the sun shining <laughs> or so. Um, there's always a lot of layers in between until you come to some result, and the result is uh, cinema. When you write, there's nothing in between. Mm. There's only you and and uh, and a little notebook and uh, and a pencil, and and you write. And uh, the the books like uh, of walking in ice. I wrote like a diary when I traveled on foot from Munich to Paris in winter because my mentor, an old uh, lady, Lotte Eisner, a great, wonderful mm. woman, was dying. Mm. And I would not like to, I would not allow her to die. And I walked like a pilgrimage up against it. And while I wrote, it's not that much the, the daily events or so, it's more the the, the fantasies and the hopes and the fever dreams and things that I describe. Or, for example, Conquest of the Useless, which I wrote while I was uh, working on Fitzcarraldo. Uh, and it has, uh, it has a very, very strong sense of words and language. And uh, what is significant is that... Um, uh, in all the travails and tribulations of making this film and all the catastrophes that happened, I mean, we had plane crashes, we had my camp burned down to the ground that was built for over a thousand people, and I lost my leading actor out of the film due to illness, and I lost uh, uh, my, Mick Jagger out of the film because he had to go to the world tour and I wouldn't replace him, and I wrote his part out of the film. So constant, uh, uh, real, real catastrophe, not invented things. They were real, and every day, and you had to, uh, you had to somehow still move on. And uh, my last refuge, the last refuge was not drugs or alcohol, or religion, or you just name it, it was language. The last resort that I have was, was writing the language. And uh, because of that, I, I believe <coughs> it, it has a different quality and a different intensity than my films. So, and because of that, I, um, I have the feeling uh, we should not only talk about my films. There's a, a background that may survive all the films as, as they are, but uh, we do not know. Uh, we should talk in 150 years from now. Mm. Then we would know. Okay, one, one last Taiwan, yes. Taiwan. <laughs> Let's yes. go for Taiwan. Oh, okay. Taiwan, <laughs> yes, my salute. How how did you write the script to Even Dwarves Started Out Small? Even Dwarves Started Small, uh, I wrote it in three or four days. It was like a nightmare that came at me. And uh, all of a sudden I saw an entire world inhabited by midgets. And, but meaning, meaning all, every single 
object like this chair mm. would be like a monster. <laughs> the world of our, mm. of our consumer goods mm. had become mon monstrous. And a chair like this would be too high for a, a tiny uh, person that was only 80 centimeters tall to even get into this mm -hmm. chair. Or they cannot, if one of the tiniest falls in love with, a, with, a, with one of the uh, young women and they try to climb on a bed mm -hmm. and she's on the bed and he cannot jump up to it. <laughs> And he takes a run and tries to jump on, on the bed and he never reaches the plateau of the bed. So it's a failure and, mm. and it's, it's like a very intense nightmare. Mm. And uh, it came at me like uh, almost like an avalanche, a dark avalanche. And it's a really a, a dark film. And strangely enough, the film has caught on with very young people. Today I get a lot of males of 15 year olds who, who are getting curious about even dwarf started small. So and because it was such a intense, such an intense vision, it was very easy to write it down in, in, in one crazy, quick sort of writing it uh, four days, maybe five days. It was maximum. So uh, these things happen and uh, Normally, I write a screenplay when I see the whole film in front of me, so I'm not sitting and I do not develop characters and I do not develop stories and I do not follow all these uh, grotesque uh, postulates of a three-act story and that the leading character has to understand his destiny and his <laughs> task uh, not later than page 29 and he should go through a crisis not later than page 60 and at the end of the film the leading character should come, come out as a, as a transformed, changed man. Bullshit! <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not into this, the dwarves are desperate and wildly into, into, they enjoy destruction <laughs> and they do it and, and that's a movie and it doesn't have three acts, it has one. And it's fine is that it is like this. So um, it's one of those films that uh, has uh, come back uh, into, um, into the attention of viewers uh, in, in very strange, in a very strange way, and I like that it happens like this. Thank you, Taiwan, for asking this question, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night.